so this rise of, of children, you know, these new crystal children or indigo children or more sensitive children that are being born embodied in this world, you must be seeing more of that, Barbara, because I know you, you've been working more with children and um, developing books for them and materials and tools that children can use here on earth in the 3D. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? I really love that aspect of what you're doing. Well, the children I've worked with are just wonderful because they, you know, they, they don't have um, some of the prejudices and, and limitations that some of us adults have. So they just, you know, they just experience what they experience and they're, they're more open to it. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I've, I've worked with many children who um, were frightened by the unusual little beings who would be in their room at night, even as young as when they were in the crib still. Um, and on the other hand, there are many children who welcomed, in fact, there are more I've worked with who have welcomed the appearance of these little beings. Mm -hmm. Like they'll say, oh yeah, my little friend who came out of the closet and came over to my bed or my little friend showed up in the room. Now the little friend was a small, short extraterrestrial, uh -huh. but from the child's point of view, it was a nice companion. I mean, some of them really felt they were companions. And there was one child who, or one woman I worked with who, when she had been a child, she would always see and was very vivid in her memory around the upper, the top of the wall where it meets the ceiling, all around the room, there were these little lights. And then the, and it, and her experiences during her growing up years always started that way. She'd wake up and look up and see the, these little lights kind of twinkling, sort of like Christmas lights, but not exactly that shape. And then they would coalesce from all around the room coalesce into a being or maybe more than one being sometimes standing there on the floor and then the experience would begin and she would be taken away but but her feeling always was oh oh my little friends the lights are here Oh wow. Barbara, what are some of what are some of the other, I guess, more common symptoms or signs of ET contact with children? So for any parents listening out there, you know, I think this is a really important conversation so that we can help people understand those early signs that something might be happening that that maybe the imaginary friend isn't so imaginary. What are what do parents need to know to, to tune into this? Often you're mentioning something very important there. Um, so often um, it happens that the child will mention, oh, my little friend was in the room last night, or, oh, I got to go away last night. I had the most wonderful trip. I went right up through the wall and right out into space. And of course, the parents usually, unless they've had those experiences when they were little, which is often the case, but often the parent doesn't know anything about this. And and just thinks that this kid has a wonderful imagination. And of course, when they talk about particular beings having been with them, um, the parents are often s saying, oh, well, that's nice, dear. That's your imaginary friend. Right. Or some parents are more tuned into spirits and spirit visitations. And they'll say, oh, that must have been the spirit of another little boy, you know, and okay, oh, that happens. Okay, is, is that your friend? Okay, dear, okay. You know, and, and they'll just keep on thinking of it that way. Right. And then that must be an extraterrestrial. Right. Well, our first, our first thought usually doesn't go to extraterrestrial contact. It certainly didn't for me when I was trying to figure out what was going on with me. <laughs> Yes, well, that's right. And in those days, I don't think when you were a child, I, I don't think, because I'm not sure exactly when you were a child, but in the um, 80s and 90s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the 80s and 90s, it was just beginning uh, 
that information was coming out about the about these visitations and abductions. And uh, so your parents might or might not have heard of this. Right, right. But before that, they probably, before the 1980s, they probably wouldn't have, or before the set 1970s, before a couple of those movies, um, they um, probably wouldn't have even heard of that at all. Right. And they just never have a chance of crossing their minds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so children very often have a nickname for the beings who come, like the woodgies or the grousies or oh. something like that, that they'll make up a name because they know that this little visitor is not like any visitors or any children they see anywhere else. It's different, mm. but it's okay in most cases from the point of view of that child. Now, I must hasten to say though, that there are some children who just straight across with every experience like that are frightened because they don't know. And maybe the being isn't particularly attractive to them, or maybe they're aware, they're conscious enough for the beginning of being actually removed from the room, from the house. And, um, and, and they worry about what that's all about. Mm -hmm. It's the rare child whom I've come across who actually remembers a lot about the actual experience on board the ship. Occasionally, there's a child who does remember both boys and girls. I run into those definitely where they, they remember things like even being given a chance to steer the ship mm -hmm. and, and pilot the ship. Of course, they're not really running the ship, but, but they're given the experience as if they are doing that. And that's quite thrilling. Mm -hmm. Or they'll have, they'll remember being somewhere else and then looking back at the earth at a great distance and being told that's the world, that's the earth, mm -hmm. that's where you live. But they're not there when they're being told that. So there are certain things, certain like key moments that they will remember. Are there any... <laughs> one quick question as a follow-up. Are there any dreams or types of, I guess, dreams that maybe stand out as an indicator of a potential nighttime contact? Oh, yes. Very good question. Um, this can be true for children or adults. Uh, many adults who come to me um, say, I have a recurring dream, especially if it's a recurring dream. And it may not be specifically a dream of being on a UFO, but it's, an ex it's a dream of being somewhere else. And there are other people, although the people, as it may turn out, if we really do a regression to the dream, they may be other beings. Mm -hmm. But from the point of view of the person in what comes through in the dream, those figures are represented by people because mm. that's what we expect so i've had a number of people with a recurring dream of uh, such as being in a big warehouse mm. and there are other people there's sort of clusters of of other people but a, a lot of big open space mm. between the walls and then if i ask the details well what did the walls seem to be like or what do the shape of this big room seem to be like? Oh, well, it's not like ours, actually. The, the walls were sort of curved, you know, <laughs> then you begin to realize, okay, and let's take a good look at those people whom you remember from your dream. Um, or we'll do a regression to the dream. Okay. Then that's really good because then I can ask questions Okay, what? Okay, look at that group of people. There's a group of people over to your right. Okay, well, let's take a look at them now. And would you describe them? Oh, well, some of them are very tall and some of them are very short. Oh, I, I see. Okay. 
Um, what about their skin color? Oh, well, some of them are kind of blue gray and some of them are sort of uh, brown and some of them kind of, you know, like white people. Um, and so I'll, I'll ask details and more and more, even though it's a dream that we're regressing to, will come out. So very often it turns out that the dream is very, very much like the actual experience that the person had. It just seems different in the dream. Um, it just presents yeah. to us, it seems to be our subconscious part of the mind mm -hmm. presents to us in the dream that which we understand and that's that which we would expect. And that's, is that what you would call, that's a screen memory, right? Even if it's a dream, it's still a screen memory. Okay. So yeah. you know, referencing sort of these different kinds of beings that people see. And early on, you mentioned there are tons of different kinds of beings. And that is so exciting to talk about because, uh, you know, we have, we have very limited knowledge in the mainstream level of what kind of beings are around and you know, what they're like. We tend to think in very polarized ways about them. You know, these types are really bad and these types are really good. But mm -hmm. I would love to hear more about the variety of beings that you've experienced, not just in regression, but also yourself. I'm curious about your own experience oh, with contact. Right. You love to hear about that. If you want to talk about that, um, because you know we we tend to apply our very human biases to how we think of these beings, right? And there's yeah. there's a lot of uh, there's some discriminatory thinking that we might not be aware of. Uh, there's fear-based thinking we're not aware of. But I personally like to think of it as, you know, human beings are one race. We think, you know, uh, yeah. three <laughs> kind of level, you. you know, we're one, we're one race. Um, but, but there's such massive, massive, endless variety uh, in what we look like, how we operate, what, what our backgrounds are, all that kind of stuff, our makeup in general. And so I yeah. think of the, the ETs as being the same way. You know, how could it not be the same out there with all of those galaxies and all those billions of stars? There's got to be massive variation. So please tell us about that. What kind of beings do you know of? What do you know about them? And what's been your own experience with communicating with them yourself? Okay, well, I'll begin with my own experience because that, of course, I'm personally familiar with. Um, the first experience I had was in 1994. I did not have a history of this throughout my lifetime from childhood on up that I feel quite, I feel very certain about that. I mean, there just are no hints whatsoever um, in my life that I had experiences before then. And I had actually asked for that experience in 1994 because I had been told by the extraterrestrial who did the channeling through one of my clients um, that when I went to England that summer for crop circles, I, was, I actually did 27 years of crop circle research in England, <clears throat> among many other things <laughs> I was doing during those years, but um, that I was told by this being that I could ask for being taken for the making of a crop circle. And so I decided to do that. And I said, how do I, how do I ask for that? And he said, the extraterrestrial said, just talk to them out loud and really mean it. Mm -hmm. Convince them that you want to be taken for the making of a crop circle when you're in England. And so I did that for 45 minutes while driving to Los Angeles airport and, um, and then had the whole trip and did a couple of weeks of vacation with my husband doing other things and then went to the crop circle territory and um, for probably about three weeks and visited lots of crop circles and then um, the very last night before the last day of visiting crop circles before flying home, uh, I, I had three little beings coming from the area of the window, just right after I turned out the light, bedside lamp. Uh, I had three little beings coming from the area of the window, and they were, looked like short beings. 
and they came and then boom, I was out of consciousness mm -hmm. until the alarm clock woke me up the next morning. Well, we, um, we got, uh, I was with a group of people and we climbed onto a bus the next morning and went to a field about 45 minutes drive away, a field that we had been past the day before, um, a field that had a couple of big megalithic stones standing up in it. So I recognized that particular field. And the day before there had been, it had been just a flat crop of wheat. But, but this particular day, there was a depression mm. in the wheat. So it looked like oh, that might be a new crop circle because that wasn't there yesterday. So when the bus stopped that we were on, um, I jumped out and joined a friend who had, was following us with a rented car. And we went back and there were four of us and we were the first ones in that crop circle. Now, when I came home again, um, in other words, about two weeks later, I had a, a regression done by one of my colleagues and it turned out that the, the night before, when the beings came to my bed, they took me out through the corner where the two walls meet the ceiling, that kind of corner, and up in the air and up through the bottom into a craft. And then the, the, the three beings, I never did really see them. I only saw their silhouettes. Um, and they put me, they lifted me up and put me in a barrel-shaped chair, and there were two barrel-shaped chairs in front of me with a being in each one. So I got kind of a look at them. They looked more like a, a gray type of being. His skin looked a little bit more tannish than grayish mm -hmm. with the lighting that was on that little ship. This was a very small craft and I could only see the the back and the side of the head of one as he would lean forward and touch a little part of the front of the craft that was part of the control mechanism and I only saw a little bit of the head of the other one because they were also sitting in barrel-shaped chairs so and I never did get a look at the ones who had come and taken me there. Uh -huh. So I, I can't tell you anything more about what they look like, except they seem to have, they seem to be short and they had bigger heads than ours and smaller necks. Okay, so. Uh, how, can I just ask you, how did you feel? Like, did you, did you remember how you felt when you were on the ship? Oh yeah, I, I was fascinated. Okay. A, a little bit nervous, mm -hmm. but not too much. I, I mostly the oh oh wow oh this is, it's really nice and lovely it, was, it looked beautiful to me the the ship oh. and um, it was probably only about twenty feet in diameter I would estimate and I was kind of sitting in the middle of it and I could feel and hear a big swooshing noise as it was going over the field and making part of the crop circle. Oh, wow. I'm like on the verge of tears right now. I don't know why. I think this is so beautiful. They answered your call. Yeah, oh, well, I do too. I was very, very impressed with that. Wow. So I, I was curious. I was thrilled. I was interested. And as I say, a little bit, nurse hope, hope I'll get back all right <laughs> right in where I was staying you know which I did yeah, they took me back to the right room <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so anyway we I could hear right next to me as if coming from the bottom of the craft this big whoosh noise and it went around seemed like we were going around in a circle with a swoosh, 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 <laughs> then wow. around in a circle, stopped, 
retreated and flew back toward Salisbury, England. And, and, and then I didn't remember anymore. I just woke up with an alarm clock the next morning. Oh, but anyways, gosh. that all of these details uh, came out in the regression. Wow. So I'm did sure- they, Did they tell you why they were doing the crop circle? Did you get any information about that? No, nobody said anything. I didn't say anything. It was just all silent. So yeah. they just, they, they came, they picked me up, they went to the right location, that field, and they did, made their crop circle, took me back, and then must so have they, flown away. They wow. answered exactly what you had asked for. You had asked for exactly that. They gave it to you, right? It was fair yeah. enough. So between, between that was 1994. So between 1994 and now, have you continued to have experiences? Do you have a relationship with a particular group or being? Can you tell us more about how that's evolved? Yes. Well, the next one uh, was uh, three years later, in uh, 1997 that I was driving along a California freeway, which followed the ocean, went along the ocean, the 101 freeway from Santa Barbara, where I'd been for an evening meeting back to my home in Claremont. And I noticed that um, there was, it was midnight. And I know that after I left the meeting, after I left that parking lot, I, I made sure that all the doors of my car were locked just for general safety. Mm -hmm. I was gonna drive home for two and a half hours drive to get home. And um, I noticed in the drive that gradually I noticed, oh, there are no cars behind me, no cars ahead of me, no cars coming the other way. I'm the only car in this freeway and it's a major freeway and it's midnight or a little bit after by that time. And I thought, that's very strange. And then I noticed there was a big sudden circle of light over the ocean to my right, perfect circle. And it just, it just blinked on and blinked off. Wow, that's weird. Okay, no cars and that's a strange thing. But I'm okay. I mean, everything's going well, you know. So don't worry. I was trying to console myself, <laughs> and then I noticed that there was a big arc of light over the hills to my left. Wow! And I thought, well, that's really strange because I know I've dr had driven that route many times. I know that there's no town over there. There are no towns at all. So what's that light coming from? Hmm. Huh. That's really weird. Well, I guess everything's okay. Still no cars on the freeway. And then I came past what I thought was a big trailer truck, big silver, it seemed like an awfully tall <laughs> silver trailer truck. And, and there was light at the bottom of it. I thought they were flares and there were people walking around the backside of the truck as I was coming closer to it. And I, I assumed incorrectly that the, this truck must have had a flat tire and they put up flares and the people were walking around to change the flat tire. And I went past the truck thinking, wow, this is an amazingly long truck. And then just, <laughs> at, the end, yeah. <laughs> and just at the other end of it, um, suddenly, Within one second, there was a big, big flash of light, sort of a peachy pink color, about the color of my jacket uh, of light. And it looked like something stretched across it, like a ribbon or a chain or something. And a crack in my windshield, right in front of my driver's seat, like a big spider ring type of crack. Oh, wow. And, and I was really shocked. What's this light? What's that thing? What's the crack? What cracked my window? And so I was going to slow down and stop and go back and ask those people, you know, what they're doing. I mean, how come my window's cracked? And I was worried. I was afraid that the windshield might blow in on me mm -hmm. in my face. It didn't, but I was afraid it would. But 
after thinking those thoughts and beginning to slow down, uh -huh, I heard another big voice in my head, like that one years earlier saying, no, don't slow down, don't stop, don't go back, just keep driving, driving, driving all the way home, which is what I thought that I did. But two weeks later, I was at a conference, that Laramie, Wyoming conference again, and Dolores Cannon was there. And I mentioned this to her and she said, oh, Barbara, we've got to do a regression to that. And so we did a regression at the end of the conference and then all the, so much detail came out. She is, a, she was a master at getting detail. Oh my God, I really wish I had been a fly on the wall of that regression. That would have been- Oh, oh yes. There's Canon regressing you. It's just making my whole day. Yeah. Right <laughs> Barbara, did she write about this in Custodians? Yes. I feel like she, I, I, I was just thinking, I was like, I've heard this story. <laughs> Good for you. The last two yeah. chapters of her book called The Custodian. Okay. Yes. So anyway, going back to the beings, Oh, although I, I must say that in, in the book, The Custodians, the last two chapters, she calls me Bonnie, the investigator, because oh. at that time, I was not willing to talk about my experiences mm -hmm. and didn't want that in her book, that it was me and right. my experience. Since then, obviously, like right now, I, I, I uh, am okay talking about it. But at that point, I wasn't. So anyway, of those beings, there were only two kinds of beings I saw, and they were very different than in the first experience. When, when my car and I were taken up in a beam of light and lifted up and put on the floor of, in this craft, um, then immediately about 20 or 30, maybe even, little short beings just came over to the car and they were the cutest little guys I thought they were adorable they had they were probably about three feet tall and they had big heads and little necks little spindly bodies they were sort of a a bluish gray a little bit more blue than gray and um big eyes big black eyes and everything. And they just seem to be adorable and so cute and so curious. They were immediately just like a swarm of bees. They were climbing up the, the hood of the car and looking in the windshield <laughs> on the top of the car, upside down, looking upside down through the, the windshield <laughs> all around the car, looking in all the windows in the back of the car. And then somehow they opened the doors, even though I know I had locked them. And they two of them got in the passenger seat and sat right on my purse and my candies that I had to keep me awake during that drive. <laughs> and, and the driver's door opened, even though I had locked it. And they, two of them ushered me out and sort of lifted, well, floated, is a better way to say it, floated me like with their hands under my armpits, but not touching me. Mm -hmm. They floated me up, I was upright, and across the room through a door into another room. And that's where I saw a little platform in the middle of the room and a column. And at the top of a column was what looked like a metal, um, almost like a beehive shape something up on the column and they ushered me up onto the platform and sat me down in a very straight chair with the arms on it and buckled me in and then brought that metal thing down and fitted it around my head like a helmet hmm. and um and then i could feel that there was a current going through my body seemed to have something to do with that helmet. And so I was just feeling it. And I was intrigued watching these little beings 
all around me like a big apron of these little short beings all looking up at me with these great big eyes and looking up and, and sort of elbowing each other so they could get closer to <laughs> you <human> sitting there. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That is so cute. <laughs> it was cute. I thought it was absolutely adorable. And um, I was just looking at them and they were looking at me and every single one of them was just staring at me and like so curious. And, and then I noticed that behind them, in other words, probably about 15 feet or 20 feet maybe away was a very tall totally white being like paper white and um he he was obviously a very different species of being he had eyes that were kind of longer this way hmm. big mm -hmm. um, i don't know what the name of that kind of being is but and he was totally white and i'm not remembering now if he had white clothing on but the whole or w whether it was his skin, um, the little ones had no clothing on, mm -hmm. but uh, he might have. Uh, but anyway, he was looking at me and he said, ah, Barbara, you're probably wondering what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> An understatement of the year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're like, no, no, I'm yeah. used to this. Yeah, you don't have to explain anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I know exactly what's going on. So, so he said, um, we are making a copy of the information in your brain about people who have uh, experiences with those of us from elsewhere in space. Ah. And um, that we know that you know a lot about this and have worked with a lot of people wow. who've had experiences with us and, and uh, many others. And um, and we we just would like to know what those people now know from the work that you've been done with them. So then Dolores, <laughs> a great investigator that she was, said, Barbara, ask what they do with this information. And so I asked, and, and he said, um, we broadcast it. And then Dolores said, Barbara, ask him <laughs> uh, who listens to it. And he, he I repeated that. And he said, oh, he said, there are many, many, many of us who visit the earth. And many of the people who, he didn't say people, many of us who visit the earth are, are very interested in what people or humans um, experience mm. when they are with those of us who come from somewhere else. And he said, it's like signals on your radio or your television that those who are interested tune into that signal. Those who don't care about that just don't tune into it. They're just here for other reasons. So she kept asking questions. And after a while, the being said, she doesn't need to ask through you. She could just ask me directly. So this is a very curious thing in terms of our understanding of time. Yes. Because I was regressing to this experience that had happened two or two and a half weeks earlier in our understanding of time. Mm -hmm. And yet, so we'd gone into what you and I called the past. Yes. But to and the being. He was, was hearing her in the present. That is amazing. And that's how the rest of the two hour session went, is that um, she was asking questions. I don't think I said anything. <laughs> because of, so was he asking questions and was giving answers. <laughs> Dolores was like, Barbara, get out of the way. <laughs> Except that, you see, he gave answers to me and I would repeat them to her. She couldn't hear his answers directly, but I could and I repeated them. And yet he could hear her. So go figure. <laughs> how, how, you know. It's such a cool phenomena. It really is such an interesting <clears throat> thing that in that state, 
the therapist or regressionist can be talking directly to an ET, directly to a, a being out there. It's just so fascinating. So yeah, I've discovered no that time, with no second time. time. Sorry, uh, but, sorry, Barbara. Pardon? Sorry about that. I just talked at the same time you did. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's it's happened. Um, oh, quite a number of times. A lot of times since then, when I'm conducting a regression, that the beings actually talk to me. They've been dealing with the person. What do you think is the reason for that? Like, why not? Why do it that way for them? Is it just more efficient? Is it just more direct communication that way? Or yes, and and I think I'm I'm just guessing that maybe they know that I've got their I've got a connection going. Okay, we're with them while I'm doing the regression rather than as I'm going about my life and I don't feel like I have a connection with them. But the regression seems to open the way mm. for them to communicate with me, which they often do. And it seems very specific to me. And, and they'll always use my name. They'll call me Barbara. There's just so much to discuss, but I've got a question for you, which is, that you know, you you were saying your first experience was 1994. This one you just described was 1997, and you've continued to have communication and experiences with them since. So, how yeah, very very quickly, I'll just say, uh, early in the 2000s, I was walking through my home one day from my study. I was going through the living room to the other part of the house, and right in the middle of the living room was standing a reptilian male being. Wow. And I mean, and there was loads of daylight coming in. I know that I saw what I saw. And normally I would be very creeped out having a big reptile or even a little reptile. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but this guy seemed like such a nice guy. I'm still amazed at that. And then I went right over to him and he had his hand out for a handshake. And we stood very close to each other, holding hands in a handshake position for several minutes while he talked to me. And that, that experience was, he said, all about giving me a conscious, awake, alert experience, mm. as he said, in the light of day, where I could see him rather than being asleep at night and thinking it might be a dream. So when you're conscious and awake and up and around and alert. Uh, so here I am to give you the validation that, yes, you can know, you can trust that these experiences really do happen. Those of us from elsewhere really do come. Wow. I was going to ask if you'd had any conscious experiences, because that's something I'm very curious about. You know, I've been exploring, we've been exploring our experiences, but, you know, we haven't had too many that are fully conscious like that, or at least I yeah. haven't. And I'm, I'm excited about that at some point to have that. Did you have fear when that first happened? Did you, did your body like or nervous system respond in a certain way, or were you just able to interact? I was surprised that there was somebody there because I hadn't heard anybody come in. I always keep the doors of my house locked mm. just out of general habit, general safety. And so I hadn't heard anybody come in. So I was surprised that there was somebody there and surprised that he was a reptilian and surprised that he seemed like such a nice guy mm -hmm. that I was happy to see him rather than being totally freaked out which I normally would if it had been a big sure. reptile. <laughs> so, um, and it was a very, very nice experience, the whole thing. So there are more details of that. But anyway, that was basically it. And then um, in 2015, um, I was walking through the hallway of my house in the middle of an afternoon. It was bright and sunny outside. I, as I walked through the hallway, there was a big window opposite, totally sunlight. And, and yet I felt at a certain point in the hallway that I couldn't move forward. Felt like there was an invisible force field 
like I could move my body, but I couldn't move past this, whatever this force field was. Mm. And then I didn't know anything until I was back there again. And um, it was completely dark out. So obviously some time had passed. I thought about two hours had checked my watch, had checked the kitchen clock. Wow. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that I couldn't move through the hallway. Mm -hmm. So I, the regression, which I had the very next day, um, showed that I was taken up through the, the ceiling, through the second story room, up through the roof, and up in the air into what looked like a, a big ball of pink, peachy, pinky cotton candy. That's what it looked like rather than like a solid craft. And I was just taken right up into that and set down on what must have been a floor, but I don't, I didn't feel anything solid, but I was standing okay. there and there were beings probably about 20 feet away, all lined up and they were just such lovely beings very, very thin, probably about this wide. And, and with heads that kind of look like the bulb of a spring onion, a scallion. <laughs> and then these very thin bodies. And they were all lined up, probably about 10 or 12 of them, all next to each other. And they were slightly undulating, like oh. seaweed under, undulates in the water. Wow. And and then and I could see to really looking at them. Wow, aren't they beautiful? And then as I looked and looked, then I could see a suggestion of eyes and little dots for a nose, little tiny mouth, and um, and the shape of the heads, as, as I said, like a scallion. And and then when they noticed that I was seeing them, then they move forward, undulating their way forward till there were maybe about eight or 10 feet away from me. And then they started talking. I didn't say anything in that experience either. <laughs> and they so what, what they were talking about was the fact that they were very, very pleased that my friend Nadine Lalich and I had just finished writing our book, Alien Experiences. And they went on and on about how it's time for more information to come out about the fact that humans are visited by these beings. It's time that they know that more and more people on the earth know about the UFOs. Time that we know about all the beings out in space, all the civilizations, all the activity going on out there, and that some of it is visiting planet earth and visiting individual people. And so they were going on quite a bit about this and I don't know who, which one of them was talking or if they were all talking. They seemed to be a group of beings sort of attached to each other. Wow. And, um, and then they went on to point out the skills, uh, the particular abilities that uh, my co-author Nadine had and then my abilities were different than the ones that she had. And they said, it's a brilliant uh, combination of the two of you. Absolutely brilliant. That her with her skills and you with your skills got together and are bringing this out for more people in the world to know about. So, so they were very, very pleased. So that, that was basically it. And then I was brought back and found myself standing in the hall and it had become dark, so probably an hour and a half at least had gone by. And uh, so that, that was that one. That was the last experience. Oh, wow. I'm going to cry again. This is, it's so fun hearing about these experiences that just validate how, how they want to support us and want us to evolve yeah. and want to help us, you know, open to all of, you know, this information. I just think it's so 
so beautiful. You've had all these years of experiences and contact, and they've been supporting you along the way to get your work out into the world. Oh, yes. And and then as I was saying earlier, that uh, sometimes it happens that when I'm conducting a regression and somebody is right with the beings, they might be on a medical table or they might be in some other situation with the beings, that sometimes the beings will say, and Barbara, we want to say something to you. And and I feel at those moments, I feel so complimented and I feel a whole different energy as if they are present with me. Now I don't see them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we get into a past event. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yet this is happening now. And it's not my imagination because the person who's being regressed and I will talk about it after the regression is over and the person is, you know, completely conscious and focused again. And um, so that that person remembers the beings doing that. Well, Barbara, this kind of leads up to what I was going to ask you a couple of minutes ago. Um, I'm curious because you've had so much experience in, you know, professionally, but also personally, how have you seen the content of what comes to you, both professionally and personally? How have you seen that change? Like, how has the information, has the information changed, first of all? And what would you say right now in the present time are the dominant messages that are coming through? Because they've been giving you so much information over all this time. And I know some of it is about what we're all supposed to be doing or what we could be doing together here on this planet Mm -hmm. as a conjoined human race. And they have concerns about how we're operating. So what what are the messages that you're getting now and have they changed over the course of your time in this profession? Well, I'd like to speak about the change first. Um, It used to be that in people's regressions, uh, they would go through the details of experiencing like a medical checkup or maybe a specific teaching or something of that sort. Um, and then in more recent years, uh, it's, it's been <clears throat> kind of a different focus. Um, they're talking more about our spiritual growth. And sometimes they talk about the whole process of ascension. And they talk about our evolving as a human species, evolving enough so that we can be part of the great galactic federation of planets and um, how we're being watched for that. Our evolution or lack of um, is definitely being observed by those beings. And um, is definitely more of a sense of their caring about humanity and also about their being extremely concerned about humanity because of what we're doing to the earth. How we're really ruining the earth, this precious planet that we value and and, and they value for us. And um, so there's a lot of concern about that and about the wars and the fighting and the murders. And uh, sometimes they will mention these sorts of things. I mean, they really, really want us to raise in consciousness and and behave better as a species. And they don't like what we're doing to animals. And I mean, you know, there's just one aspect after the other of the way that we live life that that they really object to. And in particular, they're especially interested in our nuclear capability. Yes. And they say that if we start sending off nuclear weapons, that that will not only ruin all life on Earth, but it will spread out through the solar system and even contaminate beyond our solar system. Mm-hmm. So they, of course, don't want that for their sakes either. And they know that we're hot potatoes. I mean, we could just you know, just do that nuclear proliferation at at any time. We've got so much capability of it. 
and and so much enmity and competition going on in the world that it's pretty amazing that we haven't set that loose already. So, and we do know from another point of view, uh, from the point of view of being right here on Earth, that um, at a number of our nuclear missile sites, uh, that that the UFOs have come and have decommissioned, have turned off uh, the the ability to send off those missiles with nuclear warheads. And um, I know that we've done that in this country in a number of our different missile site places. And I've heard, and I hope that this is true, uh, that they have done this in Russia yeah. and North Korea, I hope. And um, so they really don't want any of that nuclear warfare to go on. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it won't. Yeah. But we're just running uh, on a perilous edge here all the time. We're and so it, lucky. We're so lucky to have them contacting us and connecting now and, yes. and, and, and interfering in the ways they can to support us. I mean, thank God you know, for some of that. Otherwise, who knows where we'd be right now. Yeah. No. Mark, we are. We are. Mark, but do you think that there's choice in terms of timelines, whether we end up in a nuclear age or don't end up in a nuclear age? Do you hear anything about that from them? About how our choices, our decisions, our mindset, you know, takes us in one way as opposed to another? Yes, I haven't heard them speak directly about timelines, but basically that whole idea they do convey and, and that it is up to us and they they talk about how we have free will mm -hmm. and that can be perilous or it can be wonderful you can use it perilously or wonderfully and um, so anyway we're being watched far more than we're being observed mm -hmm. uh, far more than we have any idea and and they they can know things remotely from huge distances. I don't know if they use remote viewing the way that we use remote viewing or if it's some other process. But um, And I had one extraterrestrial who seemed to know so many details here on Earth. And um, I said to him one time, this is back in the 1990s, I said to him, were you, were you there with me with this instance you're talking about? It involved a crop circle. And he said, no, I've never been on earth, but I know these things remotely. And he said, this is very typical of our race. We can tune in, um, we can project our minds to anywhere in the cosmos. We, anywhere, we being like... Earth just generally extraterrestrial beings or was it that particular group or that particular race that was able to do that? Well, he was talking about his particular race, okay. uh, but it is most likely, I'm assuming, uh, true of many other races as well. I don't know if, if it's true of all of them, but I do have a very strong sense that they, as a group of, you know, collective of extraterrestrials, know so much more about us than we know about them. Yeah. <laughs> so the more we can learn about them, like what you ladies are doing and, and bringing this more to the public, uh, the better that, that we need, I think, to know more about them. Agreed, agreed. Barbara, I know we, we're running close on time. We need to wrap up, but I have one more question for you. Speaking of getting to know them better, you, you wrote a book uh, with someone called Meet the Hybrids, and this is a way you help introduce people to the very real fact that there are ET human hybrids on Earth. Yes. And I'd love for you to just talk briefly about what you know about ET human hybrids and um, how, how this information about hybridization can help us help us integrate um, our galactic family into our reality. Beautiful. Okay. Well, I think that the um, ET human hybrid project is a wonderful one because it means that these very 
um, spiritually advanced, high-minded beings are wanting to help us. And because they cannot come here themselves, they would not be able to withstand our viruses and bacteria and way of life, and they would not be accepted because they look different. Mm -hmm. um, so they cannot come here themselves. But the next best thing that they can do is create beings who have some of their DNA in them and yet um, are born here as regular human beings and certainly appear and act like regular human beings. So the hybrids, I know, there are probably about 20 people by now uh, whom I know who whom I feel convinced are hybrids. Uh, there are eight that we included in the book, Meet the Hybrids. Miguel Mendonca uh, is my co-author, and he is an excellent um, investigator. And uh, together we uh, interviewed eight wonderful, wonderful, exceptional people who we understand to be ET human hybrids. So in other words, um, a woman who gave birth to one of these hybrids here on Earth, uh, she or the... Um, embryo, in many cases, the embryo was created with her sperm, her eggs, and the father's sperm, and then mixed by the ETs with some of their genetic material, usually not just one species of extraterrestrials, but in some cases, four or five or six mm -hmm. different species combined, giving their DNA to the embryo and then that was implanted in the woman's uterus and she carried that baby full germ and gave birth the way the rest of us humans do and then the other uh, way of creating the hybrid is that when the woman is already pregnant that during that pregnancy usually around the fifth or sixth month or so uh, she is taken by the ETs and they give her an injection of various kinds of DNA from different species of them. And then uh, that injection goes right through the wall of her abdomen, the wall of the womb, and into the fetus inside. So by the time that fetus is born, at regular term, uh, that, that baby uh, is already hybridized. So these beings are living with us as regular human beings, and they go through our school systems. They look like us. Sometimes they might have a feature that is a little bit different. Their eyes might be a little bit bigger or something of that sort. Um, but they are here to help raise the consciousness of humanity. And that's what they do. Their whole work, teaching holding classes, workshops, writing, presenting, uh, working individually with people um, is all about uh, healing, helping, and raising the consciousness of humanity. Mm -hmm. So because the beings uh, cannot come and do that themselves, uh, they, this is a wonderful solution that they found to this, that they can use these hybrids in this way. So it's a very high consciousness um, motivation that's going on. That's the most, I think that's the most beautiful explanation of hybrid, the hybrid program I've ever heard, Barbara. Thank you. Yeah. Um, honestly, that was really beautiful. And also because there's, again, you know, there's so much kind of apprehension and fear around ETs, uh, otherwise known as aliens. We don't use that word on Star Family Wisdom. We find it a little bit discriminatory. Uh, so we say ETs, but, you know, there there is so much fear and apprehension around it. There is so much, there's been such a predominant media depiction of them being the big baddies that are going to come and take over the world. But what's interesting now is I really love what you said about um how the hybrid system is meant to help us it's not meant to it's not some kind of you know it's they're sneaking in and they're 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 living under the radar to do bad things on earth this is them trying to help us and then also you talked about how your in your experience it used to the contact used to be more about abductions and sort of more medically based now it's much higher level more about the evolution of the mind the evolution of the heart of the spirit 
And so, you know, we're in this fascinating time on earth right now where we have yeah. so much opportunity to learn and to grow. Yeah. And we're really grateful for your presence, Barbara, because you are just, you know, the contribution you've made, I think even though it's recognized now, uh, you're widely known, you're widely respected. I think that the weight and value of your work is going to find even more value, more power and more significance for us as a human race um, into the future. I really think so, because there's, it's not just what you've learned and how you can, and you know, the information and the specifics that you're putting out there, but how you're communicating about it is so beautiful and so balanced. You're including the light and the dark and you're including, yeah. you know, the variety of experiences and we feel on star family wisdom here that that's incredibly important that it's not all puppy dogs and rainbows and it's not all government conspiracies and mean reptilians it's you know it's <laughs> everything all all mixed together and so we're really really grateful for your example in that way thank you for that oh, oh thank, thank you very much. much.